probably in my early 20s. Um, there was a great, great judo man, uh, Professor uh, Okano, Sensei Isao Okano. Um, he's the lightest to win the All Japan. He won it two times. Uh, he took second with a broken arm. He was Olympic champion and world champion. Um, he weighed maybe, I think he won the All Japans at about 180, 180 pounds. Um, dynamic, very, very dynamic. He started a program called Seiki Juku, and it kind of means like the way of the rebel or a different path that you take. Um, and I was the first, myself and Arthur Hollins were the first Americans that he received. He was the 1976 Olympic coach for Japan, and he believed that judo is an international sport, and it wasn't just for Japan. And when we first arrived in Japan, it was just for Japan. If you were a foreigner, you were beat up, and they would, dear friend of ours, Bill Sanford, um, just passed away. Um, he got his legs, you know how we butterfly? They said, oh, you're not flexible enough. They stood on either side, ripped his growing out. I mean, a lot of things like that happened in Japan at the time. Um, they didn't particularly like foreigners. And they definitely didn't like hapas, half-breeds, hambu hambu. They didn't like them at all. In fact, we were impure bloods. At least that's what they told us at the time. But I trained there. I love Japan. I love the culture. I love the food. Um, I love judo. So Kano said, say, uh, I, I came to him and asked if he would train me. Um, up until that point, I would go to different schools. Um, we trained at Keisho in the morning. Uh, Keisho was the police academy. All the police would, would train there. Um, Koto Khan, in those days, uh, every night, one of the universities, one or two of the universities from Tokyo would show up and they would just have Ron Roy. Um, but Okano Sensei accepted me in, um, and he was training a group of foreigners. Um, a guy from Spain, one from Canada, a couple from South Africa, uh, a couple Frenchmen. Um, and so uh, my training with Sensei was much different than anything I had done before. Now I wrestled, I went to school on a wrestling scholarship, so I understand the grinding part of uh, the physicality of, of the sport. Um, before I went to Japan, I trained judo you know, two nights a week. It was Tuesday or Friday nights. That's all we trained. Um, but I understood hard training because of wrestling. Uh, wrestling's a very, very good sport. Uh, it works well with, with uh, judo because the training is somewhat similar. You have to be very tough to do both, either sport. Um, so Kano brought us in. And we would run every morning. We would go to the park and do a lot of physical exercise. I mean, we'd do push-ups, sit-ups, a duck walk. We would quarter of a mile. There was a quarter of a mile track. We would duck walk a quarter of a mile, rabbit hop a quarter of a mile, run stairs, run stairs with someone on your back, do push-ups, do pull-ups, all of those things. And that was every day. There was no break. It was every day. And sometimes you would reflect and go, Really, is that necessary to do it? Well, no, it wasn't. But he was proven a point. You do this, and it makes you tough. You don't back down from it. This is what you do. You're going to be, in fact, when we would go to a, a university, um, we would do like 500 Uchikomis before they trained, and then we would do their training, and then we would do 100 Uchikomis after. If we went to Keisho every morning, we would go to Keisho. When we went to Keisho, we'd do 100 Uchikomis before training, and we'd do 100 Uchikomis after training. And so everything we did was more than was necessary. That was just the way it was. No one questioned it. No one dared question it. He just did it. Um, we would go to the universities and uh, train with them. And like I said, we would always do more than and so when my kids came back, um, when I came back, when I quit competing, I took some time off uh, from judo, and I realized that you know this is this is where I need to be. If I don't have judo in my life, the trouble I get in trouble, um, even at 71. 
I realize that it's my driving force and it's important to me to have a place to go and have a routine. I mean, I know when I when I mean when I was training, I knew what I had to do every moment, just like Ann, you knew what you had to do. Do your exercises, do your physical stuff, you ran, you lifted, you watched what you went. I mean your life was planned out for you. And that's what a good coach does. I think I think uh, Sensei Steve Scott is an excellent coach. He cares about his athlete. He plans it out for them, what they, what, what they need. In our days, we had no coaches. And you didn't have a coach, did you? I didn't. Oh, okay. Mickey Mouse. Good guy. Um, I had no coach. I had a guy, I had a sensei that opened the dojo until I had Professor O'Kano sensei. He was a true coach. Um, his team, the, the, the Japanese team was very successful. Um, we would do stuff, I mean, I don't drink, I didn't drink then, but we went to a party, he had a party, and we had to drink. And um, he said, if you don't drink, all of you, after the party, are going to run to the Imperial Palace and back, which is 12 miles away. Well, of course, everybody drank, and we still had to run to the Imperial Palace in Bath. <laughs> and guys would stop on the side, throwing up, and he would just, you know, the, the, the senpai would run with, or ride with a little bamboo stick, ride on his bicycle, and would whack people if you were off to the side. So, um, anyway, it was a silly thing, and sometimes, reflecting back, it, it wasn't necessarily, um, how we would train today, but that was his method, and I thought he was successful. If I do what Sensei does, I'll be successful too. Um, I made the mistake of sending some kids to Japan, um, and I, I didn't monitor them, and I thought that they would have the same success that I had when I went to Japan, and that's not necessarily true. Um, I think if you send anyone there, you should send a coach as well, because they can plan things for you, and they can tell you how many rounds you should be going, what you should be doing. You don't necessarily need to be doing road work, you don't necessarily be lifting weights, you're there for judo. You can do all of that stuff at home. Um, but, but Sensei Okano did things to the extreme. I mean, he was an extreme, extreme man. If you see some of his videos now, um, you know, it shows him doing uchikomis on a tree, and he did stuff like that. And, you know, he he, uh, he fought the All Japan, he was an All Japan champion, and then uh, the Soviets, at the time it was Soviet Union, it wasn't Russia, they sent the team to Japan, the guy broke his arm, the sensei's arm, did Tomoinagi, got into an arm lock, broke his arm, he didn't submit, broke his arm, and, um, uh, soon after that, he went into a uh, slight depression. There was a point where, you know, uh, he lost, and he lost face. And so, um, uh, suicide was not off the table as an option for him because he felt that he embarrassed his country, he embarrassed himself. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen. He, he, um, came back the next year and won the Ultra Bands again. Um, dynamic uh, judo. In fact, when I was training with him, um, uh, there was a guy named Nobuyuki Sato. Um, he was the greatest mat man. He was a world champion, um, All Japan champion. In fact, the year he won the All Japans, um, we were at the Kodokan soon after that, and Okano Sensei and him had a round. Um, they had a fight. And, since I was getting pinned and he exploded off his back and turned it around and pinned him and I thought at that point I realized you know what it's not it's not just the physicality of this that makes him great it's his mental inter inner strength that the mentality of this man and his inner strength that is so powerful I mean if you're in a room with him you can feel his presence I mean like like Right now, if Anne Marie walks into a room, you can feel her presence. You know she's there. When Sensei Steve enters a room, he's the alpha male. You can feel his presence. Okano Sensei is very much like that, where he, he enters a room and you just feel his aura. 
an amazing person. I was very blessed to be able to train with him. And so um, as, as I was a, a training, um, the last year, maybe it was the last, one of the last years, Okano Sensei send, sent a guy named Tsuzawa. Uh, he was a Chuo graduate, um, sent Tsuzawa Sensei to California. And we lived in a, a dorm. We had an apartment. And there was myself, Tommy Martin, Jimmy Martin, uh, Ramon Rivera, Kenny Okada, Arthur Hollins, Bobby Burns. And that was a good training group. Um, most of those guys were uh, world team members, or they were very, very high level judo players. And we all lived together, we trained together, and it was the first Seiki Juko in America. And it was very successful, it was very, very formidable. Um, it was probably the strongest dojo in, in the United States at the time, by far the strongest. What year was that, Japan? What year was that, Sensei? What, what year was that? Uh, 1970. Five uh, through seventy-six. Um, our instructor at the time, uh, Shago Kata, loved him. He uh, opened the dojo for us, taught us judo. Um, I was blessed that I had a Japanese instructor, Shibata, uh, a Nichirai graduate, who was really when I was a little boy. He was my instructor, so I had very good lineage, as they call it, jujitsu. A good lineage. I had a good lineage uh, for judo. But Okana Sensei sent a group uh, from Japan for us to train and, and to set roots here. He also was a little bit of a rebel himself. Um, like I said, he believed that judo is an international sport. Now we all benefit from it. We see the IJF. It's a huge organization. It's a billion dollar business. Um, but in those days, uh, Japan ruled judo. The French were coming up, the Soviets were very strong, the East Germans were very strong. Um, but Okano Sensei had the vision that if you wanted, that judo was an international sport and that if Japan was going to get better, they had to embrace that. And so he brought Ruska there. Ruska, William Ruska was a two-time Olympic champion, won it in the heavy and the open. I was several times world champion from the Netherlands. And Okano Sensei, he was a, a Seiki Juku member. And Okano Sensei would bring in the best from Japan to train with the best from outside of the outside of Japan and train. And that was that was very revolutionary at the time. I mean, it was not heard of in Japan. They they segregated themselves so that even they didn't hardly even train with other schools. If you're at Meiji, you trained at Meiji. If you're at Nichirai, you trained at Nichirai. And the only one day a week when they went to the Kodokan was when they would train together. But Okano Sensei was a genius, and in fact, he married a, a girl from California, a white girl. They had several kids. Um, one of them graduated from the University of San Jose State, was an Olympic alternate for the U.S. Um, but I will tell you that this was just kind of secret. Um, I carried his little baby. His first son was Go, and I carried the little guy, and I pinched him just to cry. Kano Sensei would kick my ass, beat me up. I'd take it out of the, the little baby. And <laughs> Sensei, let me hold your baby. And I'd hold <laughs> <laughs> That's chicken shit. I'm sorry. But I did that anyway. But anyway, um, I was blessed to have Okano Sensei as my, my mentor, my, my instructor. Um, and it was, a, it was uh, somebody that a young alpha male could look up to the real alpha male and say, this is what I want to be like. And so, since I'm saying this to all of you, um, you are that alpha male. <coughs> when you come to the dojo, when you open the doors, the kids don't know what you know. Okay, They don't know. When Sensei Steve comes to this dojo, he's the alpha male. People look up to him. They want to be like him. Kids want to be like you. You're the pillars of your community. And people want to be like you. You have a lot to offer. You have a lot to share with other kids. You can teach them how to be men and women of the world. You can teach them how to be a warrior. And that's important in life. It's just very important 
in these days right now. Um, we all know that as teachers, we're both, I'm a teacher as well, um, times are different. I'm glad I'm not growing up at this time. I'd be, there's a lot, there's a lot, there's a lot of distractions out there. Um, but I will tell you this, that, that without you, know, I would be not nearly the person that I am today. I would never experience the things that I've experienced. I would never be here with you, with all of you. I mean, you know, the times I've, I've watched Anne Marie fight, and the times I've spent with Sensei Steve doing camps and clinics around the world, um, having someone like Brett Parkhill as my student. I mean, that's all because we studied judo. You know, and I was telling Jan, Jan, she has, if you don't know her, she was a fierce competitor. Very talented, very fierce, very knowledgeable. And she has a lot to offer, a lot to give. And same with Becky, she was a great competitor. And if we don't give back, the world is missing out on, on our knowledge. It really, it truly is. You have a lot to share with people. You can teach young people how to be warriors. That's important. It really is important. The values of judo are more important than winning and losing matches. To be brave, to be courageous, to be honest, to have integrity, to have good morals, that's important. Those are the important things in life. Those are the things your children, your students are gonna carry on because that's what we teach. Yeah, we teach how to win matches. I can teach, I can teach kids how to win matches, how to, how to medal in tournaments. But when everything is said and done, it's what kind of person are you? Are you going to take that, what you learned, are you going to take that and teach somebody else how to be a champion? That's what's important, I think. I really do believe that. Um, I'm honored to be here with you. I'm honored to be anytime, like I said from the very beginning. If I can share mat time with Sensei Steve and Sensei um, Anne Marie, I'm, I'm honored. And I would drive 10, 15 hours. I'm glad it was only five, <laughs> but I would spend that time to do that. Just, they're great people, and to be in their presence is worth time. So treasure your senseis, treasure the time that you have at your dojo. Um, it's not an obligation, and it's not a dredge. It's kids re are respond. You're responsible for kids, and kids look for you for your responsibility. They they need you to be there to open the dojo for them, to teach them how to fight, how to be strong, how to be courageous. People need that. Since hey, I don't have much more of over, over done it, okay? Thank you for your time, thank you for your energy. Thank you for studying judo, it's a great sport. It will open doors for you that no key can open for you, I promise you that. Study it, be the best you can. And for those of you that compete, be the best that you can. You know, you only have one shot at it. And the time is very quick. When Brett was growing up, Brett, how old are you now? 50, 55. Five. When Brett was a young boy, he came to me, uh, he was from another club, he came to me and he, he was a great young competitor. Time flies, doesn't it, Brett? It does. <clears throat> and it doesn't wait for anybody. Um, I have a, I was telling Sensei Anne Marie this, that a day does not go by in my life 71 years that I don't have regrets uh, of one, of not meddling in the world, of not meddling in the Olympics. And so uh, regrets are not a good thing. It, 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 you know what? Yeah, I, my accomplishments were great. I'm, I'm thankful. Blah, blah. But I have regrets. And so I don't want, when, 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 I'm training a young athlete, and I tell them, you can be the best in the world. I don't say that cheap, in a cheap way. I say it because I do. I know what it takes to be the best in the world. I just couldn't do it. I just didn't do it. But I know what it takes. It takes a strong personality. It takes somebody that's different. And they don't come into your, those people don't come into your life very often. So if you have someone that can be great, treasure them and lead them on the right path. If you have to send them somewhere else to get better, send them. 
we can't just hoard our people and, and think that we can't send them off. Mm -hmm. Your daughter didn't just train. I mean, she had the best coach in the world. She had you. But you sent her different places to get better. But I was very selective. With yeah, you. absolutely you were. You have to be selective because, well, you have to. You, you must be very selective. Okay, guys, I, I honor you all, and I thank you so much for having me as your guest. I'm honored to be with Steve and Becky and Jan, and of course, Anne-Marie. Thank you much. Train hard. Thank you. Thank you.